Still getting the knowledge. I mean, most teachers I don't really. Okay, let's let's get started here. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, more, more, more information that I don't want to hear. Um, okay, lecture module eight, of course. Um, we're looking at the internet and web. I covered the textbook yesterday in contrast to what I normally do. So today is kind of the extra content. And today's it's actually really interesting content. Or maybe that's just me being a geek and finding it interesting. Um, well, yeah, okay, so, so there we go. Um, standards. You heard me state yesterday, I'll say it again, web design. When I say web design, I'm not talking about pretty graphics, things like that. If there is information layout, white space, you know, and, and we'll talk about that when we get to web design. But really, I'm talking about usability, okay? So it can be rendered correctly on every platform in every browser, so W3C compliance. Um, and there, there are other things. Um, Standardization, though, is going to become increasingly important with the Internet of Things, okay? As we get more and more sensors in our environment to, to assist us, of course, the sensors have to communicate. And we'll talk about the privacy issues as well. So standards are going to be necessary now and well into the future in many areas. Search. I have a separate subpage on search, and we're going to go there when we finish this page, so I'm not going to say anything about that right now. Um, Privacy. Here we go. Did anybody look at the Google Ads preferences overnight? I did. What'd you find? I thought I was a female. Really? <laughs> 18 to 24 female. <laughs> there are movies about that. Buy a lot of um, I like action movies, too. Was that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. That's surprising. I, I've never, normally, it's spot on. So um, I did state that I want, I'll, I'll show everyone what I'm using. Um, and of course, you're seeing all my plugins. I use Chrome. Anybody here not using Chrome? What are you using? Firefox? Yeah. I, I was a Firefox advocate from the outset. Mozilla, you know, it's, it's our computer science background. And then Firefox just got buggy for me about two, three years ago. And I didn't want to sh switch to Chrome, but I did. Um, and now, actually, with, with the energy of Chrome and the plugin structure, it actually, I'm glad I did. So you're seeing all my plugins up here. I showed you one yesterday, you know, Collusion. Um, and I showed you some web design tools like Validate, you know, which is an HTML validator. This is HTML Tidy, which will check any page that you're on for HTML errors. How many people here are in the web design? Okay. Um, so you should be installing these and looking at them from this point forward. Um, and, and it's very difficult to get your page completely uh, compliant unless you're doing it by hand. And very almost no one's doing it completely by hand these days. You know, everyone's using content management systems. I use WordPress, which is very close, but does it will have some errors. Bless you. Um, so if I validated this page here, I'd, I'd get a couple errors. Um, that's what it is. Um, so let's take a look, though. I want to show everyone into my settings. So you may, a lot of people normally, if you're not using Chrome and not using these, a lot of people write these down. Um, so here's my Chrome settings. Okay. Um, and I'll go right to my extensions. So here's Collusion for Chrome. And to find a Chrome plugin, just suit, search, excuse me, um, you know, for Collusion. If you're in Google, if you're in Chrome, search for Collusion plugin. It's going to bring you to the Collusion plugin for Chrome. Um, and again, there's always the question, you know, how reputable are these things? Well, again, Google, if, if they're here and Google is sending you to the search results, they're there. But you can also go through and um, you know, look at the website, see who the manufacturer is. You'll see some other things here. Allow an incognito mode. Okay, Again, this is Chrome's way of keeping you anonymous on the web. Limits the number of cookies that um, are put on your computer and also retrieved from your computer by intermediary um, sites. So a couple of real good ones. Disconnect is very good. Um, do not track me. Okay, so all of these are going to inhibit um, cookies from being set. Right now what I have, and I just enabled this, normally I do use Do Not Track Me and Disconnect, but for the sake of this class I, I um, activated Ghostry because Ghostry has a unique um, functionality here where if I go to, say, ESPN.com, favorite site here, um, it'll show me all the cookies that are being set, but just by ESPN.com. It's surprising, isn't it? 
And of course, I could go up to Collusion now and see where and who is share ESPN is sharing these cookies with. And of course, you will see, you know, some sites that I essentially have blacklisted. Okay. And in Collusion, I could unblock these, but I'm not going to. So again, here's that interconnectivity of cookies. Can you block something by clicking on it? Um, you know, I've never tried that. And due to our limited time, I'm not going to try it right now. Okay. okay. Um, so let's see, what else? Um, Jamelius is kind of nice. Um, really, this is just an interface thing. Um, and what it'll do, it'll allow you to take out or remove ads if you're using Gmail. Of course, Gmail, you get ads on your page. Okay. So, you know, most people would think, okay, great, get rid of the ads. But let's also think of connectivity, because we now understand the HTTP protocol, right? If I have, if I'm using Gmail on my phone and ads are coming in, right, those are other requests to websites with those ads on my phone, they're using my bandwidth to show me an ad. I probably don't want that, especially if I have a limited data plan. So by using Jamelius, I can actually stop that, okay? And I can actually save some bandwidth, okay, just at least in my Gmail. Yes. What about ad block? Yep, they work. Okay. So it's going to stop the request going off. Because again, a lot of these ads are coming from third party sites. So again, if you can stop that request, you're not going to be responsible for the data. So it's just not coming. Exactly. Right, right. It's actually stopping it from coming to your, to your whatever computing device you're using. Um, here's an interesting one. I actually have it disabled here. I have it enabled on my, on my computer over here. Mask me. Mask me will. When it, you know, we all go to sites and they want our user information, they want our email address, all these things. But then, of course, that organization has your email address. Mask me will supp supply essentially a proxy email address or phone number in some cases. Um, so that you can insert, you can actually register for things, but you don't have to use your email address. And when they email back, if they have to, it goes through their proxy. And of course, mask me now has your email, but that other organization doesn't. So, yep. Yeah. There's websites for that too, like mail. Yes, there are. Yes, there are. But this is, you know, plug in built into Chrome because I, I, when I get there, I don't want to have to go to another website. And I just want it to happen. And it's, and it's real quick. You know, you just choose. A, a pop up will come up and say, use mask me email or yours. Click use mask me, and you're there. Um, now, I presented that search, we look at it from two perspectives in this class. We look at it from a user's perspective because we want to find things, and that's what we're going to look at in a minute. But down the road in web design and e-commerce, of course, I'm, if I'm an organization, I want users to find me. So I have to work on my search engine optimization. So again, if you're in the web design course, SEO SERP web, uh, Workbench, SEO Site Tools, SEO Quake, okay, because you want to know where you rank. Okay. So you have a website, you're doing good, but you know your competitor's doing better. Why? Okay. Well, run your SEO tools on your website. Run the tools on theirs. Okay. Why is their search engine ranking higher? Okay. And that, and you, and you continue to have to stay abreast of this because Google will keep changing this, so you can't manipulate search engines. But you need an understanding. So, and again, don't worry if you don't understand now. You know, we'll get it later. So that is, that's just what I'm using. OK, so um, here we go, the deep web, also known as the dark web, the invisible web, you know, the under web. Um, what else? There's Silkwood or something. I forget what it is. Silk Road. Um, Silk Road, yes. Um, OK, so we understand the architecture of the web, right? The three-tier debt three-tier architecture that is the database core, then a middle-tier business logic, and then the Apache, and I'll say web server, I'll say Apache web server quite often by default. So when I want a page from ESPN.com and I go to ESPN, they don't just have a prepared HTML page ready and send it to me. It's, it's interpreted by them, and they send me an HTML page with embedded tags. And all this other content both in the, in the columns and the tags, comes from the database. This database is not indexed by the search engines. Okay? 
Um, and there's a reason for this. One, security. I don't want the search engines going into my database. I'm not giving Google the password to my database. Okay? So if you want to be indexed well, you have to do some other thing, cache pages, things like that, so they can actually cache and, and index your content. Um, so this is great. However, because it's not indexed, there's the opportunity to have other information out there on the web. So to put this into perspective, let's look at some statistics. Okay. Public information on the deep web is currently 400 to 550 times larger than the defined World Wide Web. So for every page out there, there are 400 pages. And it's actually not in pages because, again, it's not static. It's dynamic. But for every piece of information that you can get to browsing or through search engines, there are 400 other pieces of information that are not indexed. Right? That's staggering. Deep Web contains 7,500 terabytes of information, in contrast to the 19 terabytes on the surface of the web. And quite often, this is the way it's described. If you look at the web that's accessible, that people can find, they browse, they search, imagine if you would, you know, trawlers out on the ocean, and they had nets, and they were skimming the surface of the ocean. That's the web, the accessible web. The Deep Web, everything from five feet down to the bottom of the ocean. Okay. I see it described as a glacier, where what you see yep. out of the water on a glacier is, you know, a third of the tiniest bit right. of the actual glacier but, being under the water. But and a glacier is, I think, a third of it or something, a quarter of it's above water. Okay, that's twenty-five yeah. percent. Yeah, this is <laughs> staggering in contrast to that. Okay, this is this is a pinky out of the water <laughs> with a, you know, the Empire State Building or something underneath it. Um, so. More than 200,000 deep websites exist. Now, to get to them, you, of course, you need to know their IP address. And they could be hidden away also down in directory structures. Okay. Um, now, what are these websites? And again, now I'm going to present anecdotal information, just what people say. Um, they have found, of course, terrorists. And they have found this. Okay, so this is verify. Um, organized crime. Um, you can find hitmen, illicit drugs. Um, so pretty much the whole gamut of any information you want to find. Um, it's been said that governments fund a major portion of it, including the US government. Okay. Um, it's been said that organized crime and governments use the deep web, because they have games there and puzzles and all kinds of things, to actually recruit top technology people to work as, you know, spies, terrorists, whatever, OK? Um, people have tried to reveal the deep web. There are stories out there. And, and again, I, I have not personally verified this, but I've seen it in a couple of places, um, that someone was trying to uncover the deep web, and a packet of heroin arrived in their mail. And then very shortly after, the police arrived, so they were completely set up, OK? So just, just so you know, you know, I don't know. Um, I do know the deep web exists. I do know that organized crime uses it, terrorists. Okay, and again, I haven't been to their site, so can I actually say that now? But um, who knows what is actually going on? So I'll just leave it as a question at that. Um, next, I want to uh, present the Internet of Things. Um, and this is, has wonderful applications. However, again, this has some major security or privacy implications. Um, right now, our environment isn't sensor rich. They're putting sensors everywhere now. We're being populated. Something like 50 billion sensors will be in place by 2020. And what this can reveal, of course, it can improve processes. But it also, I'm going to use, introduce another uh, term. It, reveals dark data, data that's unknown at this point. Okay? Best Buy did a study. They put sensors that could actually monitor people as they came into Best Buy. And they found something like 95% of the people that walk into Best Buy, or some vast majority, may not have been 95%, turn right. So now if you think, have you been in Best Buy? Yeah. What do you do? What do you look? Where do you look first in Best Buy? 
You do laughter. <laughs> Fantastic. So you're, you're the outlier. The best five electronics is to the left, so. You look left? Okay. Uh, well, I don't know. Okay, okay. But, um, There's like the one entrance where the left is all the boring stuff. Yeah. In, in Saratoga, all the TVs, you're, you're just naturally drawn um, to, the, to the right. So they, what they did, of course, is once they, once they discovered this, is they moved all their high-priced items to the right. Okay? So it's this type of understanding. Oh, Walmart is doing this type of analysis all the time. They'll find things that people buy or related items, and then they'll, you know, but if they're located in separate parts of the store, then they'll move an aisle, and then they find, oh, sales went up. We'll keep it there. Move it that way for the whole country. So what they're doing essentially is A-B analysis. You know, and they, Google does that on the web, too. Um, so I did want to present this. And let's look at, this is an enterprise or an organizational perspective. Then I'll introduce some, some ways, really, it could help us in our lives. So. So Jim Grubbs has been doing demos. Jim, we've been doing it for, what, 15 years together? That's right, John. This is the most complex challenge I've ever given you to figure out how we're going to do it. OK. And I want you to do it in 12 minutes or less to take everything I've said so far and bring it to life. OK, John. Well, the first thing I want to start with is that, that you know, a lot of people are confusing the Internet of Things with the Internet of Everything. The Internet of Everything, of course, is the late, it is a combination of all these market transitions that Blair has so well articulated. And when they all come together, it gives us the ability to connect people, process, data, and things. It's the Internet of Things that is just the latest market transition that is allowing us then to connect not the 99% of the unconnected. And that's being driven by Moore's Law and the continuing reduction in costs and computing and sensors. As a matter of fact, on the tip of my finger here, I have uh, a sensor. Actually, this provides IP connectivity, this little chip. How much does it cost? 99 cents. Gives us IP connectivity and has integrated Wi-Fi. That's 99 cents. So for five years, fast forward five years, pennies, right? And very low power. This still requires a significant amount of power. Forward, we're going to have sensors that are powered by the flex of your shoe or the chemicals in the soil or the heat from your body. And we're going to be able to take all of that data and bring it back and make new decisions. So just like we're seeing with smart grid, you would actually move a lot of this intelligence right to the edge of the network. That's right. To be able to provide security, policy, et cetera, and to be able to make decisions at the edge probably for the vast majority of interface, and sometimes for machine-to-machine -machine connections, for example. So John, join me over here. We're going we're gonna to show a process. As you talked about connecting these silos, we're going to take the process of producing a cola, as you have your, uh, your Coke here on stage with us. Yes. So we're going to go from growing the corn for high fructose corn syrup all the way through the retail environment and how all of this needs to connect together to give us new value. So as Jim walks through this, I'm asking each of the audience to think about your organization and think of it literally from the creation early on of the components of your supply chain through logistics, into your manufacturing equivalent, sales, into distribution, into retail, customer interface, to close the system. It is all digitized together. It gives you the information you need to gain competitive advantage and the ability to run your operations with a lot more flexibility and ability to adjust up and down based economy and dramatically lower cost. Simple too. Exactly. Okay, I got it. Now, John, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the corn stock. So you talked about machine-to-machine -machine connections and local processing. Well, let's say that part of our field gets additional sunlight or favorable growing conditions. You want those sensors that are in the field to be able to tell the irrigation system, go ahead and water that corn. So that's an example of a machine-to-machine -machine kind of connection. And we can see from our analytics uh, dashboard here, we can see the irrigation system, that part of the a growing area that's receiving those favorable conditions. We can zoom out. So as Jim goes through this, think about this, that before we focused purely on productivity of a given amount of acreage and maybe doubling the productivity. This can do. But you're talking about tying it to the whole system. That's right. Okay? And I noticed, Jim, those corn stalks over there, you've been doing a lot of work on. If you can turn to the water, you can probably increase the efficiency of your water utilization 40, 50 percent. Right. I noticed that you've got them in your home as well. I've I learned to buy a helicopter. I flew over to your home the other day. There were big green plants out in your backyard with boxes around them that uh, uh, I
assume was for purposes of this uh, demonstration. Yeah, that's our home garden. Yeah. So it's not yeah. data. Does, does, just plant. does it have hot margins, Jim? Uh, it's just it's good stuff. But anyway, John. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, moving right along here. Uh, so in our analytics page, what we're seeing is this area that we're having uh, high production. Now I'm going to click here to show our facilities, and here's another example where the field can tell the facility that we need to gear up for additional manufacturing. In this case, uh, to be able to process the corn, maybe more uh, workers, maybe more machinery online so that we can deal with those loads. Now let's move from sourcing, and let's take that right over to manufacturing. And we're going to show an example here where people are connecting with the manufacturing process, in this case through the social network of Twitter and Facebook. And we can actually see the map of tweets about our CWI Cola product here. And most of them are blue, which is a positive sentiment. But there's a couple of areas this here that are red coming data. from these uh, limited social networks where things like that. people appear to be getting Unstructured flat data. So what we're going to do here is we're going to click, and we're going to go ahead and scan this sample that came from the West Coast. And this will then show us the route that that sort of took through the supply chain, through that digitized supply chain that you talked about, from purchase to distribution to the plant where uh, the bottling plant to where the corn was grown. Now we're going to take a look at this second sample that came from the East Coast. And we'll see that this sample also came through the same bottling facility. So this allows us then to start to triangulate and figure out, you know what? Let's click on this Chattanooga, Chattanooga bottling facility and see what's going on there. So it's the ability to have all your data accessed in a way that ties it together. You could have an architect. That's right. Exactly. Now we can see the path that both of these samples took through the facility. They both went through one common machine. If we click to drill down on that machine, we can see that there's actually a, a problem with the line speed regulator in our machine. And then we can automatically notify the technician who, by the way, using a mobile device, gets that alert, and then can find a map to find out where the machine is, maybe instructions to show how to be able to fix the machine. So the average manufacturing plant in automotive, as an example, has 40 to 70,000 IP capable devices, the majority of which are really not connected. So what Rob Sutterberry and he were doing is really the interconnected uh, industries, if you will. So every segment of the supply chain all the way through the retail is going to be automated waste. We're just beginning to understand. That's right. The I like both process data and the things. Okay. Now, John, let's uh, step over here into the retail environment. And I want to show you, um, first off, as I, I'm in the retail environment, I'm uh, looking for my uh, whatever I'm going to be purchasing, in this case, uh, uh, maybe not soda. And I get a, an alert. You'll notice that on my mobile device, I'm getting an alert. It says, would you like to add 100 megabytes of free data to your cell phone or your mobile data plan? Well, this is an opportunity for the service provider potentially to sell bandwidth to the retailer to give them something to give to the consumer for watching an ad. So this goes back to the issue of privacy. Most of us as consumers want our privacy. But if we're given the opportunity to open up an application in exchange for bandwidth, that's what we're probably going to do. That's right. Now, I click here to watch this ad, and then once the ad is played, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and finish that. And it tells me that the 100 megabytes of data has been added to my account. It wants to know, do I now want to know in the store, do I want to see a map to show me where these sodas are? So that then gives me a map on my mobile device to show where I can go to pick up these, uh, this soda. Now, in addition to this, we're going to show you an application here from the back office viewpoint where we can take that data, these mobile devices that are in our environment, and what I'm going to do is take a look at uh, this month's worth of data and look at dwell times. I click on Run here, and this actually gives me a heat map to show me where people have stopped inside the store. So, so every retailer in the world wants to know the traffic pattern. They want to know where the wow, is with the highest yeah, margin yeah, that yeah. will get the most acceptance. And companies like Walmart, where I was on the board for a number of years, they required their board of directors and members of management to walk the stores regularly. With this type of approach, you can do every Walmart store in the world every day if you want. At every moment. And you can see when they stopped and when they bought and when they didn't. And when you start to combine that data with sensors that are on the shelves, potentially the point of sale information from cash registers, and even new things like parking lot sensors. This is a street line sensor that tells you if there's a car in a parking space, for example. So you can begin to see that there are new applications. You can advertise to the consumer. Not only do I have the product in stock, but I have a parking space for you as well. So we used to think of these applications as kind of separate. When our CEO, Rebecca Jacoby, talked to her counterparts about 
literally being responsible for parking spaces in the Cisco buildings, people kind of say, what are you doing? It's the interdependency of all these applications that make a huge difference. You know, when to turn on the air conditioner, the heat in the building based upon the number of spots. You know, when to put extra cashiers at the cash out line based upon how the parking lot filled up. The average Parisian spends two years of life looking for parking places. We'll solve that problem. But the real problem here is how do you interconnect this data that we're capturing? That's right. Now, John, actually, I brought a slide that just shows how we bring all of the things, all of the different components together. At the bottom of these new sensor networks that are going to require, this is where we're seeing the rapid uh, adoption of IPv6. We need all of these millions of sensors that are going to be connected to have their own location information, their own IP address. So a subtle hint to our engineers, we need IPv6 everywhere. That's right. That's right. The things that we're doing in new routing protocols to be able to take devices that may only wake up for a moment and burst a bit of data out to the network and then be able to collect that at the field area network layer and capture that data and turn it into actionable information, bringing it back through the core and into the data center where we can then run analytics on it. Or processing it down at that local level. You talked about moving UCS yes. out to the edge and moving the processing closer to where all these sensors are so that we can aggregate that information bring it back. John, this is that architecture that you're talking about and the approach that we're going to need to be able to solve this problem and to tap into that $14 trillion of value. Jim, absolutely awesome. Well done. Okay, so that's the enterprise perspective. We can see where it's going to be beneficial and for our privacy. Uh, <laughs> but, and when we think about personal uses, okay, a refrigerator that tells me I'm getting low on milk, butter, Coffee. Coffee, definitely. Okay. <laughs> um, but think about some other applications. Okay. You live in South Florida. Okay. Um, and a hurricane is coming. And suddenly they check your car. Your car checks itself automatically. You have a quarter tank of gas or a bad spark plug. And you get a message. Hurricane is coming. Fill up with gas. Replace whatever. 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 Whatever is wrong with your car because you may need an escape plan. That would be beneficial. Okay? Now, of course, your car, they can tell exactly where you're driving. But again, if you get into a congested area, you're trying to get away from the hurricane, maybe reroute you. Okay? So again, positives and negatives. Because <coughs> there are just many, almost too, too numerous to count. Okay, let's take a look at search. <coughs> Okay, so here we go. Um, I won't show this first video, but I do want to alert everyone to the way that we search. Okay? Most people do it wrong. The vast majority of people do it wrong. We're going to see how Google indexes the web here in a minute. And as soon as I say index, it's going into a database. When we're doing our search, we should be searching the way in database stores information, okay? So what do most people do? You know, they're searching for a cheetah's top running speed. They'll say, how fast is it, cheetah? What is? How fast? How do you? You know, how to? That's not going, the words how to and what is, things like that. If you're writing an academic paper, you know, you're not putting those words in, okay? Cheetah's top running speed is, okay? So, and actually, do you need the word is? Cheetah's top running speed. Actually, do I need top? I'd love to see the range. Cheetah's running speed. You know? Well, a cheetah kind of runs, doesn't it? It's not driving a car. Cheetah speed. Okay? Start breaking this down to a database perspective for your searches. This is not the way that people work. Now, right now, Google, Google keywords, really we're just looking at um, keyword matching. We are moving to Web 3.0, and a component of this is the semantic web. Now, most people will never know when we arrive or use the semantic web. Okay? I have a real quick example here. Say if I searched, I want to search for sailboats. Okay. Google will give me everything relevant results for sailboats. But it's not giving me information, probably are returning things for schooners, sloops, yawls, catches, catboats, etc. Why? These are types of sailboats. That's that mathematical is a relationship. Okay? You're actually learning about this kind of, or using it now without being aware of it, in Java. Inheritance is the is a relationship. Okay? A car is a vehicle. 
So now what I'm talking about is an ontological understanding, knowledge, contextual. Remember day one of class, we, I talked about the um, data or information hierarchy. Data, 111327647, meant nothing. Actually, someone did pick it out there, social security number. But when I put it in a table and put that heading, SSN, yep, give credit where credit is due there. As soon as I gave the, the table heading SSN, everybody knew what it was, contextual, information. And then when we describe what is a social security number, unique number, one-to-one -one correspondence, again, I'm, I'm breaking it down to its mathematical relationship, that's knowledge. So the semantic web is based on knowledge. Okay. Um, I do recommend that you watch this video. We don't have time. But so here's Google's phrase search. And again, the textbook presents it. Um, and, you know, and it does a good job. Um, this is a little more comprehensive. And all the way down here at the bottom, all these advanced search features, well, you can get to Google Advanced Search by clicking on the gear icon. Okay? So, you know, why not? Sailboats. Okay? So here are my results. Advanced Search. And you see that Google itself, in my search, is trying to set cookies. Um, because, of course, if I go to Amazon, Amazon wants to know that I like sailboats. There goes my Google ad, pre ad preferences. Um, so, but here you'll see advanced search, okay, and you can really tweak the search. Okay, so it's that gear icon in the search results. Um, let's get back here. Now, this is very important. Um, again, we're looking at it from how the user sees it. But in a week or two, when we get to web design and e-commerce, we're really going to look at search engine optimization. And to optimize search, you need to understand how Google works. This is kind of an introductory. I'm going to show, really, we're going to look at the Google algorithm here in much more detail shortly. So, but let's, let's take a look at this. Hey, everybody. we got a really interesting and very expansive question from Robert B.H. in Munich. Robert B.H. wants to know, uh, hi, Matt. Can you please explain how Google's ranking and website evaluation process works, starting with the crawling and analysis of a site, crawling timelines, frequencies, priorities, indexing, and filtering processes within the databases, etc.? OK, so that's basically just like, tell me everything about Google, right? That's a, that's a really expansive question. It covers a lot of different grounds. In fact, I have given orientation you know, lectures to engineers when they come in. And I can talk for an hour about all those different topics, and even talk for an hour about you know, a very small subset of those topics. So let me talk for a while and see how much of a feel I can give you for how the Google infrastructure works, how it all fits together, how our crawling and indexing and serving pipeline works. Let's dive right in. So there's three things that you really want to do well if you want to be the world's best search engine. You want to crawl the web comprehensively and deeply. You want to index those pages. And then you want to rank or serve those pages and return the most relevant ones first. Crawling is actually more difficult than you might think. Um, whenever Google started, whenever I joined back in 2000, we didn't manage to crawl the web for something like three or four months. And we had to have a war with them. But a good way to think about the mental model is we basically take page rank as the primary determinant. And the more page rank you have, that is, the more people who link to you and the more reputable those people are, the more likely it is we're going to discover your page relatively early in the crawl. In fact, you can imagine crawling in strict page rank order, and you'd get you know, the CNNs of the world, and the New York Times of the world, and the really you know, very high page rank sites. And if you think about how things used to be, we used to crawl for 30 days. So you know, we'd crawl for several weeks, and, uh, and then we would index for about a week, and then we would push that data out, and that would take about a week. And so that was what the Google dance was. Sometimes you'd hit one data center that had old data, and sometimes you'd hit a data center that had new data. Now, there's various interesting uh, tricks that you can do. For example, after you crawl for 30 days, you can imagine recrawling the high page rank guys so you can see if there's anything new or important that's hit on the CNN homepage. But for the most part, this is not fantastic, right? Because if you're trying to crawl the web and it takes you 30 days, you're going to be out of date. So eventually, in like 2000, Three, I believe, we switched as part of an update called Update Fritz to crawling a fairly interesting, significant chunk of the web every day. 
And so if you imagine breaking the web into a certain number of segments, you could imagine crawling that part of the web and refreshing it every night. And so at any given point, your, your index, your main base index, would only be so out of date because then you'd move back around and you refresh that. And that works very, very well. Instead of waiting for everything to finish, you're incrementally updating your index. And we've gotten even better over time. So uh, at this point, we can get very, very fresh. Anytime we see updates, we can usually find them very quickly. And in the old days, you would have not just a main or a base index, but you could have uh, what were called supplemental results or the supplemental index. And that was something that we wouldn't crawl and refresh quite as often, but it was a lot more documents. And so you can almost imagine you know, having really fresh content sort of a, a layer of our, our main index and then you know more documents that are not refreshed quite as often, but there's a lot more of them. So that's just a little bit about the crawl and how to crawl comprehensively. What you do then is you pass things around and you basically say, okay, I have crawled a large fraction of the web, and within that, that web you have, for example, one document. And indexing is basically taking things in word order. Uh, well, Let's just work through an example. Suppose you say Katy Perry. In a document, Katy Perry appears right next to each other. But what you want in an index is how many, which documents does the word Katy appear in and which documents does the word Perry appear. So you might say Katy appears in documents 1 and 2 and 89 and 555 and uh, 789. And Perry might appear in documents number 2 and 8 and 73 and 555 and 1,000. And so the whole process of doing the index is reversing so that instead of having the documents in word order, you have the words and they have it in document order. So it's okay, these are all the documents that a word appears in. Now when some com someone comes to Google and they type in Katy Perry, you, say, well, you want to say, okay, what documents might match Katie here? Well, document one has Katie, but it doesn't have Perry, so it's out. Document number two has both Katie and Perry, so that's a possibility. Document eight has Perry, but not Katie. Katie nine and 73 are out, because they don't have the right combination of words. 555 has both Katie and Perry, and then these two are also out. And so when someone comes to Google and they type in Chicken Little, Britney Spears, Matt Cuts, Katy Perry, whatever it is, we find the documents that we believe have those words, either on the page or maybe in backlinks, in anchor text pointing to that document. Once you've done what's called document selection, you try to figure out how should you rank those. And that's really tricky. We use PageRank as well as over 200 other factors in our rankings to try to say, okay, maybe this document is really authoritative, it has a lot of reputation because it has a lot of page rank. But it only has the word Perry once, and it just happens to have the word Katie somewhere else on the page. Whereas here's a document that has the word Katie and Perry right next to each other, so there's proximity, and it's got a lot of reputation. It's got a, links point, a lot of links pointing to it. So we try to balance that off. You want to find reputable documents that are also about what the user typed in. And that's kind of the secret sauce, trying to figure out a way to combine those 200 different ranking signals in order to find the most relevant document. So at any given time, hundreds of millions of times a day, someone comes to Google, we try to find the closest data center to them, they type in something like Katy Perry, we send that query out to hundreds of different machines all at once, which look through their little tiny fraction of the web that we've indexed, and we find, okay, these are the documents that we think best match. All those machines return their matches, and, and we sort of say, okay, what's the creme de la creme? What's the needle in the haystack? What's the best page that matches this query across our entire index? And then we take that page, and we try to show it with a useful snippet. So you show the keywords in the context of the document, and you get it all back in under half a second. So that's probably about as long as we can go on without uh, straining YouTube, but um, that just gives you a little bit of a feel about how the crawling system works, how we index documents, how things get returned in under half a second through that massive parallelization. I hope that helps. And uh, if you want to know more, there's a whole bunch of articles and, and academic. We'll take a look in more detail as time goes by. Um, I did want to present this, and I know it's kind of hard to read, but um, understanding Google's page rank from a, it really is a popularity contest. So this is presented from, you know, someone running for 
prom king. Um, so it's kind of funny. Um, so if you read through, okay, um, it all depends on who is voting for you. How, are pe how do people vote for you? Links to your site, okay, how credible are they? Um, so it kind of gives the example, well, okay, you have a lot of links or a lot of votes, but they're all coming from the marching band. Who cares? Okay. Uh, kind of offends me because I was in band and I was in marching band. I went to band camp. But um, you, know, you know everything about me. <laughs> so you can see, you know, my Google ad preferences are right on track. <laughs> so in other words, really nobody cares about my life, which is good too, from a privacy perspective. Um, so it comes to down to the right votes, okay? Um, you know, if popular people, again, popular websites are voting for you. But again, they can't be damaging websites. Um, it could be a popular site, but maybe they are known spammers or known links. So just by guilt by association, um, it gives the um, analogy of, well, if somebody wants you to win, they're going to win. If, if, if the principal wants you to be prom king, they can probably rig it so that you're, you're a prom king. Um, so if government sites, if college sites, .edu's link to you, you're probably going to have a very high page rank because it's, it's reputable. Um, you can't just link to a friend and have them link back to you. Okay? Yeah, it increases your link count, but Google sees right through this and says, okay, you know, you're just voting for each other. Your votes cancel each other out. So I do recommend you come back, read through this infographic. I know it's hard to see here, um, but come back and do that. Um, great video here. I'm not going to show it on how Google evaluates and continually improves their search engine. Um, and it really is unbelievable. I mean, literally updates every week or month. So um, I recommend you see that. And get a chance to let everyone out six minutes early. Wahoo. Um, so that's it. See everyone next Tuesday. Yeah.